I don't think he should have been let out at all. He played the system, but I did uh, predict that he would kill again. The 15th of December, 2016. 3.18pm. Chesson Railway Station, England. The emergency services were notified that a man had jumped in front of an express train and suffered serious injuries. They were immediately dispatched and, upon their arrival, came across a gruesome sight. The man in question had lost his right arm and his left hand after being struck by the train. The 64-year-old was swiftly stabilised and taken away to hospital. The police soon learned his name and went straight over to his flat on Dartmouth Park Hill, Islington, to try and find a next of kin and it was here that they found something absolutely shocking. Lying in the living room was the dead body of a woman. A belt was wrapped around her neck, and a blood-stained hammer lay nearby. Little did they know, the man they had just taken to hospital was a serial killer, and his crimes were unprecedented in British criminal history. Fifty-one-year-old Angela Best was a devoted mother of four and also a grandmother. She was described as loyal and fun, gentle and generous. She was also referred to as being the life and soul of her family. She was the kind of person that would help anybody in need. She had moved to Tottenham, London, from Manchester and had been there for years. In 1996, at a City and Guilds course on furniture restoration, she met a man called Theodore Johnson. They soon began a romantic relationship and moved in with each other, but the relationship was not smooth sailing. Theodore exhibited controlling behaviours and was physically abusive to Angela on more than one occasion after she had confronted him about infidelity. In September 2016, after being together for almost 20 years, a chance discovery would change everything. At their home, Angela found a letter. It had been written by Theodore. The contents of it were disturbing and shocking. He had written out a confession detailing how he had killed a previous partner. Angela was stunned and could not believe what she was reading. This was her partner of nearly two decades, someone she had shared so much with and been there for. Knowing that she could not keep this to herself, she decided to confront him. She asked him what this was about and what was going on. He admitted that what he had written was true. He had killed one of his previous partners, but the disturbing confession did not stop there. This was not his only conviction for taking someone's life. 64-year-old Theodore Johnson was originally from Jamaica and was one of 11 children. He had worked on a banana plantation and moved to the United Kingdom in September 1980 to be with his wife, 23-year-old Yvonne, with whom he shared two sons. He got a job as a car mechanic while she worked in a factory, and they seemed to be doing well starting their new life in the UK, living in a block of flats in Wolverhampton. But just a few months later, this would all change. May, 1981. Everything seemed normal in Wolverhampton. It was a Sunday, so there wasn't much to do, apart from relax and get ready for the upcoming week. The neighbour in the flat next door to Theodore and Yvonne heard what appeared to be a tussle going on in their flat. As the neighbour went out into the living room to look out of the window, he saw residents of the neighbouring flat block looking over to where he lived. An ambulance was driving up towards the block of flats. On the concrete ground at the bottom of the flat block, Yvonne lay in a critical condition after plunging from the ninth floor. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, she would soon die as a result of her injuries. As the police began to investigate, witnesses who had seen what had happened made it very clear she had not fallen in some sort of tragic accident or misadventure. She had been deliberately thrown off the balcony by Theodore. She had grabbed onto the balcony and tried to hang on, but her grip loosened and she fell nine stories. Theodore did nothing and watched her fall. 
It emerged that an argument had broken out as they had been due to go to church, and Yvonne hadn't wanted him to go as he was not dressed smartly enough. Theodore had smashed her over the head with a vase, and the argument had moved out onto the balcony. Theodore was arrested and charged with murder. He was sent to Birmingham prison to await his trial date. While in prison, he wrote to his neighbours, telling them that Yvonne had been abusive and violent with him, and he had snapped and fought back after the argument had broke out. He said that he had used the vase to hit her over the head, and after the fight had moved out onto the balcony, he had pushed her off. Theodore knew that the prison guards would read any correspondence going to and from his cell, and would also be aware of its contents. He was trying to paint the picture that he was the victim. Not only this, but if he could argue that he was provoked, this could mean he would face a lesser charge of manslaughter. During the trial, his neighbours were never called to testify about their experience of living next door to Yvonne and Theodore. They had never heard any altercations or anything that backed up Theodore's claim of provocation and being abused by his wife. Theodore said that his wife would nag him to do chores, which was something the judge would actually refer to in his sentencing remarks. A police officer would stand up in court and say that Theodore Johnson was a victim of domestic violence. The jury was swayed. He was convicted of manslaughter by reason of provocation in November 1981 at Stafford Crown Court. The judge said that Theodore was a battered husband and that Yvonne had been violent towards him, hitting him with a broom. He served just three years in prison. After his release, he went on to start another relationship with a woman called Yvonne Bennett, and they lived together in Low Hill, Wolverhampton. They would also go on to have a daughter. Yvonne's sister Janet took an immediate dislike to Theodore and described him as controlling. Yvonne would eventually move to Holloway, London to get away from him. Janet said, personally, we didn't get on. We were arch enemies. He was very controlling, which was one of the problems with my sister. He told her who to talk to and where to go. I tried to encourage her to leave him. She went back. That was the whole idea of going to London in the first place. She left him in Low Hill, but he followed her all the way to London. She could not get rid of him. Neither she nor Yvonne knew about his previous conviction. Janet said she had found out from Theodore's family in Jamaica about just how violent he was and that he had a conviction relating to the death of his first wife. Janet would later say, They said, get the police involved, this man is dangerous. I went to the authorities, but they took no notice. Neighbours would say that he kept a very close eye on Yvonne, was very controlling, and they could also hear loud arguments between the two of them. The police would be called out on at least one occasion. Alongside the violence, he would also make threats to harm himself to keep his partners under his control. Yvonne and Theodore eventually separated after he found out she was seeing someone else. But rather than accept the relationship was over, Theodore began stalking her. Yvonne went to the police in Finsbury Park to try and get their help and get him out of the home they shared. Janet also went down to London to help her sister and stayed there for three weeks before leaving. A few days later, everything would change. September 1992 Theodore was back at the property on the Six Acres estate in Finsbury Park. Still refusing to leave her alone, he had given her a box of chocolates to try and win her back, which, like all of his other attempts, she refused. Then... While their two-year-old daughter slept nearby, Theodore strangled Yvonne with his belt. He then called the police from a phone box to confess to what he had done. Within minutes, the police were on scene and found the distraught, crying child just yards away from her mother's body. Nothing could be done, and Yvonne was already dead. They then went on the hunt for Theodore. He would soon come up on their radar, as he had gone to try and end his life in a park in Barnet, but this attempt was unsuccessful. Some investigators believed that this attempt on his life was not a genuine one that was driven by regret over what he had done, more so that it was an attempt to paint himself as a victim and be emotionally manipulative. He was arrested and charged with murder. When the police officers looked into his criminal history, they were stunned to find that he had a previous conviction in relation to the death of another intimate partner. The investigating officers were confident that they would be able to secure a conviction for murder. The legal staff were then asked to go to the Old Bailey Courthouse in London 
as Theodore Johnson was going to enter a plea. Medical reports were submitted and the prosecution accepted that he had both a personality disorder and depression, evidenced by the attempt he made on his own life. In March 1993, he entered a plea of guilty to the charge of manslaughter instead of murder, and it was manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He was given an indefinite hospital order with restrictions under sections 37 and 41 of the Mental Health Act. The judge described Theodore Johnson as not a violent man. In September the following year, he was already out of the hospital for the first time on an escorted community parole. Stunned members of Yvonne Bennett's family actually saw him on one occasion out with a member of staff. They could not believe he was already being allowed out of the hospital and neither could the police who had investigated Yvonne Bennett's death. By mid-1995, he was allowed to join a city and guilds course on restoring furniture, which gave him two days a week of unescorted leave after he had successfully convinced the hospital staff that he posed no danger to the public. This was a man who had killed two people, being allowed out of hospital after just a few years. A twice convicted killer was allowed on unescorted leave and staff had no idea what he was up to. It was on this City and Guilds course that he met Angela Best. She had no idea of his criminal history. On the 10th of May 1996, he made an application for a conditional discharge from the hospital, but this was refused. However, following a mental health tribunal on the 30th of October 1997, he was released from hospital. One of the conditions was that he make social workers and doctors aware of any new relationships he had. They visited at home and compiled a report for the Department of Justice every three months. The tribunal made note that Theodore was aware that all of his future relationships with any women needed to be treated with extreme caution, given his history. However, he would proceed to lie about his relationships. He had already been seeing Angela Best for a year by this point and staff were completely none the wiser. These lies would go on for nearly 20 years. Flash forward to 2016. When Angela found the letter of Theodore's confession and he admitted to killing not one, but two previous partners, she ended the relationship then and there. But as she was such a kind and caring person, she did not cut him off completely and agreed to help him if he needed her in the future. On the 14th of December 2016, Angela told her daughter she was going to accompany him to the Jamaican embassy the following day to help him with a passport application. She arrived at his property at around 9.20am on the 15th of December 2016. As the morning carried on, Angela's son tried to contact her, but he was getting no response. Despite Theodore telling her he needed her help at the embassy, he had actually made no such appointment. After she arrived at the property, he brutally attacked her, strangling her with a dressing gown belt and beating her with a hammer as she desperately tried to fend off the blows and protect herself from the onslaught. Just a few hours later at 3.18pm, the call was made to emergency services to report a man jumping in front of a train at Chesson Station. Not long after, Angela's body would be found. A post-mortem was carried out and it was revealed that she had died as a result of neck compression by ligature strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. She had been struck with the hammer six times. As officers began to investigate, the horrifying picture began to unfold. This was a man who had two previous convictions for killing his intimate partners. Even though the condition of his release in 1997 was that he tell the authorities if he began another relationship, he hadn't done this and had lied to them for a staggering 20 years. He had not only lied to them, he had lied to Angela as well, who had no idea of the level of danger she was in. During every one of those home visits made by the authorities, apart from two occasions, he was given prior notice that they would be coming over. That way he could ensure he got Angela out of the property, and it gave him time to hide her belongings, making it appear he was living alone. The flat was never searched due to patient confidentiality rules. Theodore had his last appointment with a social worker and psychiatrist on the 8th of December, a matter of days before he killed Angela. He was still maintaining he was not in any kind of romantic relationship. 
he was found to be showing no signs of depression. Two days before Angela's murder, he had been due to meet a social worker, but this had been cancelled and rescheduled as the social worker was off ill. His long history of controlling behaviour and violence towards his partners was staggering. When Angela went on to start a new relationship after leaving Theodore, she was described as being the happiest she had been in a long time. As seen in his previous relationships, Theodore would not take no for an answer and continued to tell her every day that he loved her, exhibiting the same possessive behaviours and controlling nature. One of the detectives who had worked on Yvonne Bennett's case said that when he discovered Theodore had killed for a third time, he could not believe it and was absolutely disgusted. He said he had been under the impression that Theodore would have remained in hospital for a significant period of time, not the four years he ended up serving for Yvonne Bennett's death. At the end of January, after spending weeks in a hospital intensive care unit, he was charged with murder, a charge he denied. He entered a plea of guilty to the charge of manslaughter for the third time. But on the first day of his trial at the Old Bailey, and most likely having realised the evidence that was stacked against him, he finally changed his plea and pleaded guilty to the murder of Angela Best. Prosecutor Mark Haywood said, this is a man who is controlling and violent to the women in his life, and who, when crossed, will kill. The defendant is someone who would rather she did not live, if that life was to be with anyone but him. And so, quite simply, he killed her. Theodore's lawyer told the court, he does not wish to be alive. He hates himself for what happened. Mr Johnson will lead a miserable existence. We recognise the devastation felt by the family members. His lawyer also argued that the decision to release him by the Mental Health Tribunal in October 1997 had been flawed, as it relied on him being honest about his relationships, something he repeatedly failed to do. After changing his plea and pleading guilty to murder, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years for a crime that was referred to as brutal and merciless. Judge Richard Marks said, the attack by you on Angela Best was sustained, vicious and utterly brutal. She suffered an unimaginably terrible death. He also said that Theodore Johnson's repeated lies meant that the authorities did not have a chance to tell Angela about his past. Following the sentencing, Theodore Johnson attempted to stand and walk to the cells, but was too shaky and had to be escorted out in his wheelchair. Angela's sister gave a statement outside court. Angela has children and grandchildren whom she doted on and loved dearly. Angela has parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, and a other extended family and friends who all loved her dearly. She was the heartbeat of our family. By eventually pleading guilty to murder after 12 months since his arrest and subjecting our family to unnecessary additional trauma, he has shown in all cases he was clearly of sound mind. Angela's son Raphael also paid tribute to his mother, saying that she was the type of person who was always going out of her way to help people. He said her death was slowly driving me crazy. It makes me feel ten times worse when I think of the kind of person my mother was. Her other son Fabian said he now hated life, and his mother was the only person who really understood him. Following his conviction, the Camden and Islington NHS Trust said that as they had been in charge of caring for Theodore whilst he was out, and had been doing so since 2004, they would give a full independent report to Angela's family that included the conditions he was released under in 1997. The coroner found that Angela could have lived if health workers were aware that he was in a relationship with her, as they would have been able to tell her about his past and what had been done to his previous partners. The sister of Theodore's second victim, Yvonne Bennett, said that she was astounded by what came out at the inquest and believed that had Theodore spent longer in jail after killing his first wife, the life of her sister could have been spared. Theodore Johnson would lodge an appeal against his sentence and it went to the Court of Appeal. It was here that his sentence was actually increased to a minimum of 30 years 
as it was ruled to be unduly lenient. This means he will be in his 90s before he is even eligible for parole, so it does remain highly likely that he will die in prison. When all of the information about Theodore Johnson finally came out, people were outraged. One of Theodore Johnson's former healthcare assistants would later say in an interview that she believed he should never have been released. I feel really sorry for the victim's family because had he still been in there, this wouldn't have happened, so it could have been prevented. But I did uh, predict that he would kill again. He's already killed two women. Um, he loses his tempo, he couldn't control himself, and that's why he's killed again. I don't think he should have been let out at all. He played the system. Theodore Johnson is a serial killer responsible for the deaths of three women. Three women who had hopes, dreams, things to see and do, and children who loved and adored them. Knowing that so many opportunities were missed that could have saved lives is, quite frankly, appalling. The devastation caused by his actions are best summarised by those left behind. Janet, Yvonne Bennett's sister, said, "'It totally destroyed our family. "'She was such a big part of our family.' Nothing was done to protect my sister. The same sentiments are echoed by Angela's sister, Valerie. Angela was such a truly beautiful, gentle, loving, wonderful, fun, youthful, generous and loyal person. The life and soul of our family unit. Our everyday lives have been affected in every way imaginable. We as a family are completely destroyed and broken by the senseless and selfish, horrific actions of another. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in today's case, we have left links to further resources in the description box.